Welcome everyone to the Easy Power Thursday webinar series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm your host for today's webinar. We try to bring a, a broad range of topics in electrical system design, analysis, and safety for our audience. And today we have as a guest speaker, Mr. Ian Higginson, who is the engineering services manager here at Easy Power. And the topic is one that uh, we receive a lot of requests for. And as our, our habit, we would appreciate your participation in a couple poll questions as we start. Uh, there's no obligation or liability. It strictly uh, gives us perspective on the audience's uh, standing on the topic. And our first question is, have you or your company been involved in a uh, large scale PV project previously. So if you would please participate. As I mentioned, we have a lot of requests for this subject or this topic. And uh, it's one that uh, I don't think we cover that frequently. So that explains our high demand today. So it looks like we're close to a quorum. Let's give this another five seconds. All right. And so here's how folks have weighed in on this. Looks like we have a fairly broad mix. Again, thank you for participating. And then, uh, are you familiar with the uh, Solar Photovoltaic Power Plant Modeling and Validation Guideline standard that was released by the Western Electricity Coordination Council in uh, December of 2019? And again, this is fairly esoteric. So I'm curious to see how many people are familiar with this. And uh, you'll, Ian will be referring to this during the presentation. So have your pencils ready. <laughs> so it looks like we're close to a quorum. Let's give this another five seconds. Uh, just as a uh, housekeeping note, we have pre-recorded the presentation so that Ian can be sitting on the sideline and uh, responding to questions as they come in. So by all means, take advantage of it. All right, thank you for participating in our poll questions. Uh, give me a second and I will uh, have Mr. Higginson's presentation en route. And again, thank you for participating today. Hello and welcome to this Thursday, April 7th edition of Easy Powers webinar series. My name is Ian Higginson. Engineering Services Manager with Easy Power, and today we'll be shining daylight on solar facility electrical studies with Easy Power and XGS Lab. A quick housekeeping note: this is a pre-recorded session, so please hold questions until the end. Or if you do have questions, enter them into the chat feature, and we can try and answer those in real time. The power industry is participating in a large growth of solar vol photovoltaic systems (PV) in recent years. With that trend really only expected to continue. There are a lot of factors that are contributing to this, maybe most noticeably right now being the Ukrainian-Russian conflict, which is spurring a lot of conversation about domestic energy production, including renewables. Solar PV is a very mature, scalable technology and will definitely have a position in our future energy mix. At the conclusion of this webinar, we hope that participants will understand how to perform various solar PV electrical design studies using Easy Power and XGS Lab. So today we're going to cover, of course, a brief description of a solar facility, as well as the overview of designing such a facility, including data collection. We'll then jump into modeling analysis, covering topics involving dynamic stability for interconnection, short circuit, power flow reactive compensation studies, harmonics, protection and coordination, arc flash risk assessments, and finally grounding. We'll close the webinar with questions from the audience. Today's discussion will primarily focus on utility scale PV installations, those in the range of 10 to 200 megawatts. However, many of the modeling techniques and analysis approaches discussed today can be used for those smaller commercial or cogen style PV installations. So a typical solar facility is going to have the components and equipment listed here in varying amounts. 
So starting with your PV panels, which will be constructed into blocks or arrays mounted on infrastructure, trackers, things of that nature. Further combined together at skids that contain your inverter, cables, transform equipment, interconnection points. Stepped to medium voltage in a feeder or collector circuit that is brought to an interconnection substation with a main transfer further stepping up the voltages to your utility scale high voltage system interconnection point. So a solar facility is going to go through general stages during design, you know, some of which are listed here. At the earliest phases, we're going to be scoping the facility, deciding its size, which is going to be informed by things like financial models, the mix of generation and loads that you are trying to service, things of that nature. Once solar is selected as part of the mix of solutions, siting the facility becomes important. Physically, where is this going to be located? This opens a lot of discussions about land use, environmental impact, and, and various regulatory concerns. Throughout all of this, obviously, data collection is ongoing to various degrees. So early in your design process, information may be typical or assumed. And as you progress, it's going to be refined. And then, of course, we're going to start looking at the types of studies we do during different stages of the facility design. In a preliminary sense, we may be looking at things such as dynamic stability type interconnection studies, short circuit, power flow, reactive compensation, and grounding. In the Towards the detailed design phase, we'll be typically looking to validate prior analyses, look at our harmonic spectra, perform protection coordination studies, and finally, do arc flash analysis. This slide has some various milestones for a typical solar facility design, starting with planning, leading through the review, construction and post-construction phase with accommodations for things like a major equipment change in the middle. The big takeaway from this slide is that the design has to strike a balance between the accuracy of models and the validation of those models. As data becomes progressively detailed, we increase the accuracy of our models to the point where we then step into this process of validating the results of this model through comparison to other simulations or actual on-site testing. Throughout all of these decisions, of course, we have to strike a balance between cost, accuracy, and time. Generally, you can choose two of those three things to maximize at the detriment to the third. A note on data collection. Typically, this is going to be heavily influenced by the stage of design you're in. So at the, again, preliminary stage, data may be assumed or based on typical values, past projects, reasonable assumptions. This is appropriate for helping develop scoping documents or filling forms out or general asking general, answering general questions related to the facility design. As we increase the accuracy of our design, we'll be looking for more accurate input data, including information from actual bid documents or spec documents, the ratings of equipment that is to be selected for the site or is representative of equipment that will be going on site. And we may also start seeing measurements come in, particularly things for grounding analysis, soil resistivity measurements, for example. In the validation stage, in more detailed stages of design, we'll start looking for data such as test reports for transformers or other equipment, nameplates of equipment that is purchased or has been purchased for the site or is already on site. And additionally, the highest form of validation is obviously testing or data that comes directly from the field equipment. Stepping into the modeling and analysis portion of our discussion, we'll start with dynamic stability for interconnection type studies. So dynamic stability is analyzing the response of a electrical system operating at some synchronous speed to 
disturbances effectively and these disturbances are analyzed at that you know surrounding that synchronous speed so in north america that's a 60 hertz system the in progress ieee 3002.9 guidelines will be available in the future to provide engineers with recommendations uh, for how to analyze and model electrical systems for dynamic stability including solar pv installations the intent of this new standard will be to replace brown book chapter eight uh, but for this presentation we're going to follow the western electric coordination council solar pv plant modeling approach as well as the national renewable energy laboratory equivalent collector system approximation which is shown on this slide so effectively you take a lumped equivalent of for each type of inverter and pv array which for this case we only have one type shown lumped equivalent for the inverter step-up transformers create a single equivalent circuit for representing the collector system model your main transformer and then effectively as much of the utility electrical system as you're interested in modeling each generator and inverter within easy power will have a stability tab where you can enter data for the models of that generator its excitation system so in this case we're using a inverter type generator model the program provides some default values but there are a few fields which should be user customized things like the rated mva voltage and amps of your inverter equivalent inverter you can also do things like model inrush characteristics for transformers as well there's some load dynamic modeling capabilities which we're not going to really go into since we don't have any of those in the example model here to run a dynamic stability simulation you have to create a script which is done inside the program this tells the program what actions to take and for what durations so in this example we're faulting the utility substation bus for a very short duration and then clearing that fault and then running for an additional duration to see the effect of the equivalent inverter and PV system. So here we can see the simulated bus voltages at the interconnect and also at the inverter AC terminals due to the disturbance on the utility system. So short collapse of voltage and then a the beginnings of a recovery, although the simulation does cut off at one second. So not the full recovery back to nominal voltage same here with frequency for the same disturbance this recovers much more quickly to nominal than the voltage and here we can see the effect of reactive current injection from the inverters based on their excitation model due to the disturbance on the utility electrical system moving on to short circuit Easy Power provides flexibility to perform three phase, single phase, and DC short circuit calculations all within the same electrical one line. For three phase calculations, you basically have two choices of methods, the ANSI methods, which we break into standard, standard complex, and the characteristic current method. The big difference between these methods is how the X over R ratios at different fault locations are calculated. So for those interested, I encourage you to read our Easy Power online documentation, which describes these in more detail. Or you can switch to the IEC 60909 method, which we also won't cover in any great detail. You select between ANSI and IEC methods in the system options tab, which also has a couple other program control selections you can peruse depending on the types of studies you're going to perform for solar facilities in particular the inverters are going to be a source of short circuit currents that you would like to model with some degree of accuracy the program differentiates between igbt or thyristor type inverters for short circuit calculations the difference makes is is inconsequential but for power flow the thyristor type inverters will have additional data entry fields for you to adjust 
the inverter fault characteristics are basically a multiple of the full load amps of the inverter and a duration. So for depending on the type of analysis you're doing, you may select different points in the inverter's fault AC fault waveform to simulate. For example, inverter momentary contributions may be as great as three to five times the full load amps, but quickly decay within moments to 1.3 to 1.5 times the full load amps. So depending on which portion of the waveform you're interested in, you may enter different multipliers. So for arc flash, you may be interested in the most conservative high currents, but for protective device coordination, you may be interested in lower contribution levels. And those are controlled under the inverter tabs as shown here. Finally, once your data entry is complete and for the inverters as well as the rest of the system, EasyPower provides you essentially single quick reports to analyze short circuit magnitudes as well as equipment duties. So shown here is a low voltage momentary report which lists the various AC buses that were faulted, in this case, the asymmetrical amps as well as the equipment duty amps at those locations for comparison. Although you can generate custom equipment duty reports as well with a, effectively a single click. Power flow analysis for PV installations is particularly useful when investigating whether or not the facility will meet its generator interconnection agreements or for looking at the voltage drops along your collector circuits and whether those will violate equipment operating thresholds. So starting from the model that's built to the appropriate level of detail for short circuit analysis, we are offered new options related to power flow as shown below. So starting from operating mode, uh, standalone mode effectively makes the inverter act like a swing source but with its capability limited to the connected DC system. So AC system overloads can cause the DC system voltage to become depressed and effectively the solution will collapse, which in more or less mimics what would happen in a real world situation. So standalone is typically used for, again, the smaller scale or commercial type cogen PV installation. For utility scale, more often than not, the mode we'll be simulating will be a voltage control with the inverter set to a specified real power output uh, and a control set point for the connected bus selected, a voltage control set point. In constant PQ mode, the inverter is set to specified real and reactive power output values, uh, and the inverter will attempt to produce those uh, with within its capability. A note on the voltage and constant PQ modes, if the inverter DC voltage, the connected DC voltage drops to below the minimum threshold, which defaults to 0.9, inverter output KW is reduced, uh, favoring reactive power production until that minimum voltage threshold is reached or the system collapses due to inability to supply the required reactive power. So for the DC arrays themselves, the maximum power is given by this equation where VMP is called is the voltage at maximum power and ISC is the short circuit current from the array. So as the voltage of the system increases above VMP, the real power of the panels the capability of the panels to generate real power will also decrease in a linear fashion. So for a given inverter kilowatt real power set point, the connected DC power should always be greater. And on this slide, we also give some voltage relationships that can be established between the AC and DC systems on each side of the inverter for inverters with and without smoothing capacitors. Again, power flow enables single click report features, giving you things like branch megawatts and megavars losses, voltage drops, and it can flag violations in voltages as well. Information on the branch megawatt and megavar 
contributions as well as the voltages are useful information for doing things like reactive compensation analyses where we're attempting to size, for example, a capacitor bank to shift the load of reactive power generation away from the inverters to improve voltages along our collector system. So in thinking about reactive compensation analyses, here are a couple of equations that are potentially useful to limit not only percent voltage rise at the connected point for the capacitor bank, but also estimate the size of the capacitor bank in terms of reactive power. These equations are useful again in as a first pass for sizing capa capacitor bank, which can be modeled in easy power and used to verify, again, things like your generator interconnection requirements or reduce the impact of bus voltage drop along your collector system. With an electrical model of your PV facility appropriate for power flow analysis, engineers can also use Easy Power to simulate harmonics. Harmonics analysis in Easy Power is a linear analysis. So each harmonic order is individually simulated and combined through a superposition to get your total demand or total harmonic distortion at given system buses or branches. Of course, with each new analysis, new data entry is required. So a harmonics tabs exists for some equipment within Easy Power, particularly in the case of solar PV facilities, inverter current harmonic contribution at each given harmonic order. And this can be entered manually or Easy Power has a library of information that users can pull from for preliminary type analyses at specific locations, particularly breakers. Users can specify that as a location to analyze for IEEE 519 compliance, for example. And there's some data entry that we can discuss a little bit later related to that. The reporting features related to harmonics are quite flexible. You can get detailed harmonic spectra reports as well as tailored summary reports geared towards things again like IEEE 519 analysis, looking at losses due to harmonic loading, derating transformers and conductors as a result of harmonics currents, uh, sizing filters, uh, and then there's some other options as well. For this presentation, we'll mostly be focusing on the IEEE 519 standard uh, analysis because that's most applicable to utility grade PV installations. So using our load flow example from previously, let's say we have determined a five megabar capacitor bank is required for this installation to help with the reactive compensation. We can perform a harmonic frequency scan using easy power at the bus where this capacitor bank is located. And in doing so, we can see from this example that that bus has a harmonic resonant point, a peak near the eighth harmonic order. So currents in the system that are near the eighth harmonic order, harmonic currents are going to result in voltage distortion throughout the system. We can also look at things like a bar graph of the voltage distortion, which the program is calculating for that same bus. And we can see from this bar chart that there is voltage distortion, particularly at near around the seventh harmonic, which has some effect due to the eighth harmonic resonant point. For IEEE 519 compliance, as mentioned, the program will generate nicely formatted reports. This goes back to those prior specifications for the point of common coupling breaker, where it requested information on the demand loading of the facility and the short circuit ratio while the easy power program takes those values and selects the appropriate tables and and uses them in the appropriate calculations from ieee standard 519 in order to flag violations in either harmonic current injection or voltage and as we can see from this report these inverters simulated are violating not only current injection but voltage harmonic distortion requirements at the point of common coupling. Protection and coordination at PV facilities is an interesting topic and along with most of the things covered today could be the focus of our entire discussion. But 
for the sake of expediency, we'll cover three main areas. The zones of protection you can represent in easy power, phase and ground overcurrent protection, and what do you do when we're considering abnormal system conditions such as over, under voltage and frequency protection systems. For zones of protection, we're primarily going to be representing things like differential zones uh, and primary backup overcurrent zones. In easy power, differential zones are mostly a visual representation on the one line. However, we can accommodate those clearing times as part of our arc flash analysis module. The software has a large suite of overcurrent protected devices for both phase and ground to select from and can readily add new equipment that is missing from the library at user request. And then for under and over voltage and frequency protection, we'll talk a little bit about that on ensuing slides, but the program doesn't natively simulate these conditions. However, using different analysis modules such as power flow or dynamic stability, you can get insight into how the system would behave, you know, as a result of your over under voltage or frequency protective device settings. For overcurrent coordination, the program has a large palette of options related to time current characteristic curve creation. As you can see from the plot on the slide here, many characteristics can be included, including damage curves for equipment, cables, and transformers. You can include also starting characteristics and overload characteristics for motors, which again, is not really covered in this discussion, but can be represented. And of course, your protective device characteristics fault, ticks, full load amperage, ratings, things like that are all displayed on the plot. For protection design at a PV facility, you'll often have a fuse characteristic with which to coordinate upstream overcurrent protected device settings. That's due to the fact that the inverters are a relatively static expected controlled amount of real and reactive power generation and can be fairly easy to coordinate with in terms of protection. So fuse coordination is generally the goal of protective devices for the medium voltage collector system, and as well as making sure that you are accommodating your equipment damage curves and full load uh, ratings and security against inrush currents is also important. For voltage frequency protection, the commonly utilized guidelines are from uh, PRC 024-2, which are the plots shown on the screen here, uh, above being voltage ride through and the below being the frequency ride through requirements. So these are broken into essentially tripping and no tripping zones that the PV facilities will need to adhere with. We also have IEEE standard 1547 2018, which provides some guidelines for specifically distributed energy type installations and recommendations as well. Voltage and frequency protection is often both at the inverter level and at the power plant controller PPC level. So in general, the best practice is to make sure those settings both comply with these ride through requirements. That's often the easiest way to ensure compliance. The software, the Easy Power software, does not directly simulate voltage or frequency elements, but one can, through the use of other simulation tools in the software, again, load flow or dynamic stability, get some ideas on whether or not these protection systems will, will operate. And in the dynamic stability tool specifically, there are ways to script in tripping actions based on excursions in voltage or frequency that users can explore if they want to do more detailed analyses. But for the design of protection coordination systems, often the requirement is to show that the site can remain in operation in compliance with these curves that are shown here. With the protection and coordination systems model, the Easy Power software can be an incredibly powerful tool for arc flash risk assessments at PV facilities. The program has the latest arc flash risk assessment methodologies, NFPA 70E, 
IEEE standard 1584, as well as a method from the NASC, which is applicable mostly to outdoor overhead transmission and distribution type installations that you might find at some at some PV facilities. But for the sake of this presentation, we're going to focus primarily on the IEEE standard 1584 method. So the IEEE 1584 method is valid between for three phase AC enclosures between 208 volt and 15 kV. So when the voltage range is exceeded on the high end, the program will use the Lee method. IEEE also does not cover DC enclosures at this time. So the easy power software uses what's called the maximum power method for, for DC enclosures. With each new module comes new data entry requirements and ArcFlash is, is no different. The first thing to select for each enclosure will be bus type. Easy Power provides a drop down list of many different types of common enclosures to select from, which in turn populates the given enclosure with information about the physical characteristics of that, of that enclosure, which can be shown on the right hand side under the ArcFlash hazard tab for a given a given enclosure or bus. The Default enclosure sizes, for example, are based on manufacturer's data that has been given to Easy Power and adjusted such that it will be applicable for most installations of that type of equipment. However, the program does allow you to get very detailed and user specify those enclosure characteristics on an enclosure by enclosure basis if you should so choose to do so. There are also control type options that apply to the entire analysis. So here on the left is in the short circuit options is where we can choose the, the methodology, the standard to apply, which in this case is IEEE 1584 2018. For some installations, you may choose to exclude the main protective device for a given enclosure in favor of operating based on the next upstream protective device. So the program can automatically exclude main protective devices for each enclosure. As a nod to the fact that some protective devices may require many hundreds or thousands of seconds to clear for arcing faults, the program lets you set max times based on voltage level ranges. So these are maximum escape times. Uh, it's refer referenced in the IEEE 1584 standard. So you can choose to set those to limit arc flash incident energy calculations to a maximum duration. The program also lets you pick the time in the current waveform to calculate arc flash based on. So by default, the momentary or one half cycle currents are used. There's another method that's common, which is called the integrated method that was developed by Easy Power for use with facilities that have lots of motor or synchronous generators. It takes into account the fault current decay a little better and produces what some would consider more realistic results for given enclosures. So that's another option. Doesn't really affect or apply to PV facilities, so we're not going to talk about it during the course of the presentation, although folks can feel free to ask questions on that at the end of the webinar sort of control options on the bus by bus or enclosure by enclosure basis are under the arc flash hazard tab again users can select to just have the program calculate arc flash or you can exclude buses as well if you don't care about arc flash energy calculations at that location you can also choose to hard code in values which again is not something typically recommended for pv facilities and you also have the capability to select static clearing times or fixed clearing times for buses in order to simulate the effect of things like a transformer differential zone, for example. So with the program set up again for ArcFlash, the results are sort of a one-click report to generate yourself a table of ArcFlash risk assessment calculations, as well as display threshold values and incident energies on the one line. So in this example, everything's flagged as red because it exceeded 
the preset th threshold set in the program for those those buses. The table of results is useful not only for reporting and analysis, but can be something you troubleshoot based on. So in this example, I've introduced an error in the transformer one fuse where it did not have a characteristic included. So the program cleared the low side bus in manual time, resulting in about 150 calories per centimeter compared to an adjacent similar unit, which cleared much more quickly based on the fuse characteristic and only had a, well, only had 50 calories, but still a factor of three less. So by comparing results for two locations you know should be similar, you can help identify errors in your model using the arc flash results. And then sort of as the final step, the program allows you to generate arc flash labels for each bus you've simulated enclosure with, with the relevant information pre-printed on the labels automatically. And you can also, on a bus by bus basis, generate a, a work permit, an energized work permit for different predefined work tasks, which this dialogue will generate a Word document effectively that will be pre-filled in and formatted that then can be further edited and, and signed off on by supervisors and things like that. But the program will do a lot of the legwork in putting those permits together for you between the arc flash labeling features and the permit features the model and software can very easily integrate into existing electrical safety and workmanship programs we'll close out our discussion today by spending a little time with utility scale pv grounding analysis using the xgs lab software utility scale pv grounding typically falls under the nesc or nec standards with a bit of overlap between the two, depending on application. However, both refer to IEEE standard 80 for guidance on analyzing grounding systems. So most of our discussion today will focus on IEEE 80. The reason both standards reference IEEE 80 is the fact that the standard provides methodologies for calculating step and touch voltage threshold values. So step and touch voltages are dangerous conditions which can exist during a facility ground fault that would lead a worker to have unsafe voltages either across their body from their hands to their feet known as a touch voltage or between their two legs which is known as a step voltage the intent of a grounding analysis based on ieee standard 80 would be to design the grounding system in such a way that these voltages are limited under ground fault conditions to below the threshold values established so when you're performing a grounding analysis, awareness of your grounding software limitations is key. Some softwares are limited to equipotential grounding assumptions, which would be essentially uniform voltage across the grounding system. This assumption is not typically valid for large geographic spread out facilities like a utility PV farm. So soil modeling is another limitation that some software may have. You may be limited to uniform soils or very limited stratification in soils. Multi-energization is another important aspect to consider when analyzing certain fault conditions across large geographic areas. So having that capability in your toolbox is important. And then having robust conductor modeling capabilities is also necessary because the impedance of conductors and the types of conductors can have a sizable impact when you have a large conductor count, such as a, a utility scale PV facility. So fortunately, XGS Lab has all of the capabilities above and more and can provide you a lot of flexibility when designing your analysis of a utility PV grounding system. So XGS Lab has two different flavors, so to speak, the first being GSA FD, which is essentially underground installations only, so it's suitable for grounding analysis. We also have XGSA FD, which does everything GSA FD does, but also incorporates above grade installations should you be interested in simulating the electromagnetic characteristics of above grade installations, such as transmission lines or distribution lines. So the typical approach to designing a grounding system is to 
get a CAD drawing of the system, usually at some preliminary design stage, and then import that CAD drawing directly into the XGS Lab software. The CAD drawing will have conductors to scale, so you can import directly at scale or modify the scale during import. The other approach, of course, is to use the XGS Lab's fully fleshed out drafting tools to design your grounding system or edit a grounding system that has been imported previously. So there's a couple options there. Next up, of course, is analyzing your soil. Generally, the first step in any soil modeling process would be to obtain soil resistivity measurements. There are various ways of doing this, but the two most common methods are what we call four pin methods, either the Wenner or Schlumberger method. The Schlumberger method is commonly used at solar facilities for taking very long traverses because it can limit some of the need to move probes around between different measurement traverses. With your soil data in hand, engineers can use XGS Lab to develop soil models, which will typically fall into different categories, the simplest being just an entirely uniform soil model where the resistivity doesn't vary with depth or, or spacing across the geographic area of your of your facility. Multi-zone models can can vary across the, the geographic location of your facility. So you can design the soil model to be different in certain locations and analyze differing effects there. We can also have multi-layer soil models, of course, which change uh, with resistivity based on depth. So many large solar facilities will need a multi-layer model to adequately represent the electrical characteristics of the soil and get your correct voltages as well as any fault current distribution effects that you may be wanting to simulate. With our grounding layout and soil model in place, the next step is of course to energize the system with a fault. There are a couple ways we can do this. We can basically draw in a fault point and specify the energization value of that fault point which is kind of the simplest and traditional approach. The XGS Lab software actually also provides a tool called NETS, which effectively allows you to develop a small power system model within the software to simulate, you know, simulate various electrical system conditions, including ground faults. So you can connect your designed grounding system up to a small system model and get a fairly accurate representation of how the currents will divide through the system again this back to this fault current split concept before they reach the grounding system and so one of the mitigation tools in your arsenal can be to ad accurately model the fault current distribution of your system in in an effort to get those step and touch voltages down below calculated thresholds once you've energized the system the program, the XGS Lab program, will allow you to plot your step and touch voltages in, in a nice visual format superimposed on top of the grounding system. So this slide contains a couple examples of those plots, which are color coded with red being the most severe or non-compliant voltages and blue, green, white colors being essentially compliant or, or low low risk voltages. So the same system is shown in both of these plots uh, with the left plot only containing the main grounding conductors of the system. So as we can see in this plot, there are areas with red and orange and yellow colors indicating fairly either non-compliant or fairly high voltages calculated during a ground fault, which you know may be present in areas where you you don't want them to be. On the right hand side is the same model, but with the support infrastructure for the tracking posts or the, or the mounting hardware also included. So these can be steel posts driven into the earth, for example. Representing these can have a drastic impact on your compliance results, as we can see from the plot on the right, where most of the red and orange and yellow colors have been replaced with you know, blue compliant type voltage calculations. So the XGS Lab software, as we mentioned, has a lot of conductor modeling capabilities and can adequately represent the electrical characteristics of your steel mounting and tracking hardware. 
in order to better improve the compliance of the grounding system that you're analyzing. And this approach also extends to things like the facility fence line, for example, if you are interested in analyzing for step and touch voltage compliance at the perimeter fence. So that concludes today's webinar discussing utility scale PV analysis and design. So thank you very much for your attendance. And I'd like to take this time to open the floor for questions from the audience. Ian, I, I want to thank you for doing an excellent job. We've got several questions that yeah. came in. Yeah, and, uh, and I've, I've, I can read some of these off if you'd like, Jim, or just... Uh, Especially know. ones that have, yeah, general, uh, inf you know, sure. to the general audience. Yeah, why not? Let's go through a few of these. So we had a couple of questions kind of about coupling, you know, lithium ion batteries with, um, with PV and wind facilities. Uh, the question was specifically for emergency lighting, but we're actually seeing, you know, in fits and starts, I would say the, the emergence of our uh, battery energy storage future, which is coming. So the there's there's quite a bit of interest in the industry uh, to to um, to couple the uh, you know to couple either existing or new facilities with with battery energy storage systems, not only for just you know emergency lighting purposes, but actually to perform um, you, you know things like arbitrage. So you could, for example, generate during periods of you know, light system loading and and store that energy in in your battery energy storage system, and then you know during during heavier periods of you know, peak peak loading on the system, you could you could discharge that for a profit. So that's one one example of why a BES would be you know included in a solar facility or or you know wind for that matter too, um, and they can help with other things like voltage regulation, um, they can act kind of like a capacitor bank essentially too, you know, to, to help with the reactive. Uh, so your inverters can prioritize generation of real power, for example, and you can use your best for controlling the reactive power. Um, I'm gonna jump on a couple of new questions uh, before I go back to some of these, because I've answered some of these and, and a couple of new questions I haven't answered. There's one question on when voltage control mode or PQ mode would be used. Uh, really voltage control mode would be used when you're trying to simulate uh, around some kind of uh, expected real power operation point, and you want to see if your systems, uh, you know, if your system will be stable around that operating point, effectively from a voltage uh, standpoint. If if your inverters can, you know, supply the reactive uh, power necessary to uh, regulate the voltages on your system, and again, this would be within a range, so you want to keep your your collector circuit voltage is, you know, something within plus or minus 10% of nominal. So that might be why you'd use a, a voltage control mode would be to look at if you're able to meet those requirements. And if you if you don't, you know, that's another reason to explore adding a capacitor bank. A capacitor bank can help shift some of that reactive compensation load off of the inverters and put it, you know, closer to where that that reactive uh, that you know reactive power is needed, which is at the collector substation. Um, PQ mode you would use primarily, so the real reactive power mode, I would use that often for demonstrating your LGIA compliance. So if they, let's say example, you need to output, you need to show that the facility can output to, you know, a certain power factor at the POI. You could, you could, it usually is an iterative process, but you would need to iterate, you know, to, to achieve a total output at the POI uh, from the inverters. And that could be something you do by specifying specifying exactly the real and reactive um, uh, real and reactive power. Uh, question on does XGS at lab comply with WEC guidelines? I'd have to research that a little bit. Um, I can refer that to, uh, unless David Lewis is on the call. I'm not sure if David uh, jumped in. So I'll have, to, I'll have to circle back on that one. Is voltage fluctuation a concern in PV application? Can we use Easy Power to do the study? So voltage fluctuation, I guess, would that be in terms of uh, voltage fluctuation on the DC side due to changes in um, changes in, in you know solar radiation? That 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 would be something that would be a little difficult to do with the current uh, conceptualization of the software, but you can definitely uh, simulate things like uh, AC voltage fluctuations for sure. Um, re yes, there are ways to represent SVCs in Easy Power, although they're usually represented by um, kind of a static injection of real reactive power. Um, that might be in the dynamic uh, stability module would be where 
uh, SVC representations would live. So in, in a power flow sense, they wouldn't really, you know, if you're doing a power flow study, for example, you would you would maybe represent some that is a static contribution for a you know a period of time you're interested in. Question on what should be used for DC buses after inverters calculated per PVC data or accept voltage from the inverter. So I did. Uh, if you look back on slide, there is a relationship. Uh, Jim, do you? Let me see if I have control. Um, can you click back in the slides, maybe, Jim? Or so it's on a video. I can't go back. Uh, no, it's on. Oh, so, yeah, that's true. Um, so let me pull up. We'll pass the PDFs of the slides out. Um, and maybe I can share my screen. Let me pull up that slide All right, deck. I'm going to make you the presenter. Yeah, I will. Uh, let me pull up that slide deck. But there was basically a slide in there, and you'll have the the presentation following this. You know, we'll we'll send out the PDFs of this. But basically, there is a uh, some recommended voltage relationships between the AC. So if you know the AC system voltage, you can kind of calculate what the expected DC system voltage would be uh, based on. Uh, you, there's some differences depending on the inverter if you have a smoothing capacitor, which most are going to have nowadays. But but yeah, there there will be there's some relation. I apologize, I didn't have this. Uh, I should have had this up before I started. Uh, while I'm doing that, I'll answer. But yeah, it's on the slide. There's a there's some equations for relating those voltages on the slide. Yes, we can model large scale batteries. So yes, they the there is a there is a battery model uh, within Easy Power. And that can be used again. Similar, it's it's going to act similar to a, um, you know, it's going to have a, a, a capability, you know, essentially, you know, a a amp hour capability of the battery. So we'll it it will have you know an, an internal resistance characteristics, things like that for for representing the short circuit um, behavior of the battery. So that that will be something you can model for again. Uh, the DC side of the system, and then it's going to be coupled through your inverter model. So the the inverter kind of acts like a a break point between the AC and DC systems for a lot of the analysis. So for short circuit, you know, your AC short circuits are going to be heavily controlled by what your inverters are set up to be. For DC short circuits, it's again, most of the time the inverters are considered to not be a source, a significant source of DC fault current, but you know, the batteries, your PV panels, those those pieces of equipment will have DC short circuit characteristics that you can model and analyze for things like again, DC short circuit magnitudes or arc flash we do we can do dc arc flash using the maximum power method for example so yeah while i'm getting that up um is, i don't see any new questions coming in um yeah so ian let me uh, just kind of say the normal yes. procedure is we will be posting the video on the website oh, and, okay at that and we send everyone an email with that information and that's where we'll post a link to be able to download the pdf of the slides so Wonderful. everybody will have access to it Okay, and I'm gonna I'll share. I'm gonna show my screen here. So okay, so it should be you should see a screenshot of the PowerPoint. And Jim, you can confirm if that's showing yeah. up. Yeah, it looks but, good. But basically, these are the two kind of voltage. This this is a way to kind of establish an AC to DC voltage relationship. And again, that's the the this is at no load, and this is again considering with or without or with a smoothing capacitor in your inverter. So those are a couple of equations that you can use to again, establish what your your DC voltage should be for a given AC system voltage. Uh, is there an economic justification for residential solar installation? Uh, well, not without um, not without tax credits, probably. I mean, a lot of a lot of these systems may, you know, and there are some jurisdictions. I shouldn't say that I, it, it kind of depends jurisdictionally, right? Because some some municipalities will will make it profitable for you to put a PV array on your house because you can participate in, again, the um, you know, you can sell power back to the grid and essentially offset your bill. So if you live in a, if you if you live in an area with expensive electricity, you know, it might it might pay out. And a lot of you know, if you have a good strong uh, solar irradiance and, and those kind of factors, so it it probably varies quite a bit. But yeah, some areas it's there would be an economic justification for it. When running power flow and DC buses in K, what does that mean? Uh, that's just the flagging it. Uh, so that's the operate, you know, there's a nominal voltage and it's going to actually calculate what the operating voltage is. So if the operating voltage flat, it varies within, you know, too, too big of a percentage away from your uh, nominal voltage, it'll, it'll flag it in red. And that may or may not be a problem depending on how you define your nominal voltage. So again, you can kind of dial that in or you can change you can actually change what the threshold percentage is so uh the the one in the program is probably like a five percent it probably flagged it at about five percent deviation so you may be able to 
handle a larger deviation. So a lot of inverters can go plus or minus 10% of nominal voltage, for example. So um, you may be able to change those thresholds. You can change those thresholds to have the program, you know, not be as sense, not flag things visually as it, with it, as much sensitivity, basically. Ian, it looks like we're at our time limit. Yeah. All right. For a great presentation. Yeah. Thank you for everybody's uh, interest in this. I really appreciate it. Great questions. Lots of really great questions. And yes, the slides will be available later and we'll make sure everybody's got uh, notification of when those are posted. Good day yep. to all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day.